So it looks like uh, we have about 40 people that have already joined in. So um, we have a very packed program, program today. So maybe we, um, if everybody is happy with this, we could um, um, start um, this straight away. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's actually quite a glorious day in Canberra. So sorry that you're all inside. I hope you can go a little bit outside after. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that um, we are like, uh, oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I haven't slept very much lately. Um, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the first to acknowledge country and also um, pay my respect to um, the custodian of the land on which uh, I'm located, the Nanawal and Nyambri people, and would like to pay my respect to the elders, um, past, present, and emerging. And I'd like to extend um, a warm welcome to all First Nations uh, that are uh, joining us today, and also to uh, every one of you who make the time um, to come and listen to this seminar. Um, my name is Anik Temasai. I'm a um, research fellow at CAPER. I'll be chairing the seminar today. Um, so today's seminar is um, the short and troubled life and sudden death of the community development program. Um, so uh, as I said, we have a very packed program, so I'm not uh, going to um, go uh, in great details um, uh, with the bios as they are already available in the description of the seminar. Um, but um, so today um, to talk to us um, about um, this topic, we have the quite a lot of uh, great range of uh, experts uh, on the topic. Um, John Altman will um, begin um, by explaining us the format of the presentation today, uh, followed by Francis Markham, uh, Elise Klein, and um, joining us from Queensland, uh, from uh, Zoe, like <laughs> the seminar will be concluded by uh, Zoe Steins. Um, and uh, we'll be taking um, question and answer following the panel um, presentation. And if you have questions, um, please feel free to leave some in the chat and um, we'll, you'll be able to ask questions to the panel, either the whole panel or individually um, following the presentation. Thank you very much. I'll leave you the floor, John. Thank you very much, Elise, and uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everybody um, on the Zoom. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri traditional owners here in Melbourne, uh, where I'm living. And I'd also like to acknowledge CAPER uh, for its leadership and some research, and so, and so much research on Indigenous employment programs uh, in recent years. Now, revisiting the title for the seminar, The Short and Troubled Life and Sudden Death, of the community development program um, makes me uh, wonder uh, whether one might argue that uh, the uh, short and troubled life has been um, too long um, and whether the uh, sudden death uh, that's planned for 2023 is uh, sudden enough. Um, it just uh, really beggars belief um, that this uh, program has existed now for six years. Um, this seminar is part, uh, a part uh, of a, um, a two-play act. The first act, as the epigram for the seminar suggests, to envisage a better future, we must start by properly looking at the past. A quote from Farah Dub Boiwala um, tells us uh, what we look at today, uh, the recent history of the community development program developed since 2013 with the election of the Abbott government. Um, today's um, presentation has four brief scenes. Uh, the second um, act, um, which is uh, we're calling um, Guiding Principles for New Livelihood and Work Program Remote Indigenous Australia, uh, will also have uh, four brief scenes and is scheduled for fortnight's time when the first Senate report on a new program named the Remote Engage Engagement Program by Minister White will be available. Now, the research that we report today 
was instigated by Zoe Staines in April this year. She was keen to bring together analyses of various proposals for unemployment policy in remote Indigenous Australia, drawing on much work undertaken at CAPA. Little did Zoe know how prescient her proposal was, as in the May budget context, Minister White announced the abolition of the Community Development Program from 2023 and the co-design of a new program to replace it. Very quickly, we organised a small workshop underwritten by Zoe at the Australian National University in July, where the four of us presenting today were joined by Mike Dillon, Will Sanders, John Quiggan, and most importantly, Lisa Folks, who had completed her PhD on transformations of labour market programs for remote living Indigenous people at CAPA in 2018. I personally would like to acknowledge a huge debt to Lisa. I've learned a lot from her thesis research and from our collaborations. Subsequently, the four presenting today co-authored a paper, Guiding Principles for a New Livelihood and Work Program in Remote Australia, quickly published by the Australia Institute in August. We distributed this paper widely and held a small workshop with stakeholders in early September that was planned to be face-to-face -face, but ended up being by Zoom. The seminars we present here aim to share and allow critical engagement with our ideas. Today's seminar, as the epigraph for it suggests, looks back at the recent past, the convoluted development of a deeply flawed program that has clearly failed and is now to be abandoned. Our next seminar looks to provide some principles that might be considered in co-designing the new remote engagement program. Our panel presentation is as follows. Francis will tell us something about the impacts of the program using quantitative evidence, especially on how the program further impoverished already poor welfare recipients. Elise will look at the purported logics of the program and its links to broader punitive neoliberal approaches that are arguably racially discriminatory. Zoe will examine the Community Development Program contracting and administration arrangement and arrangements as an element of broader processes of disempowerment. And I'll begin by making a few brief comments about the politically fraught development of the Community Development Program from 2013, its operational contradictions and negative impacts. When the Abbott government was elected in September 2013, it came in with an election commitment to revive work for the dole and a strong ideological commitment to mutual obligation. Mining magnate and, 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 philanth and philanthropist Andrew Forrest was engaged to review Indigenous employment and training programs. In doing so, the incoming government overlooked Forrest's earlier efforts in this arena five years previously when he devised the Australian Employment Covenant that was to employ 50,000 Indigenous people in two years as an element of closing the employment gap. The Australian Employment Covenant failed. Forrest undertook his review, assisted by Marcia Langton, Alan Tudge, staff from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, where Indigenous policy was now located, and the Fortescue Medals Group, his Mindaroo Foundation, and other private sector banking and consulting experts. His report, Creating Parity, was released in August 2014. The report went well beyond its terms of reference. It linked high levels of unemployment and welfare dependence with social dysfunction and sought to establish a framework to discipline the behaviour of the Indigenous jobless in remote Australia. This ramped up a trope focused on agency that individuals were, were personally responsible for their dire circumstances, a trope that was fashionable among many reformers in recent years and had gained much traction with conservative politicians. Much was influenced by the advocacy of Noel Pearson since 2000 to eliminate welfare poison and right-wing imported um, paternalism of people like Lawrence Mead, and the behavioural economics of Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. 
Most controversially, Forrest recommended that full-time work for the dole activities from day one of unemployment will keep people active. That's a direct quote. And recommended a healthy welfare card where all income would be quarantined to ensure that those on welfare would not be, and again I quote, an easy target for those peddling drugs, illegally sold alcohol and gambling. Creating parity was heavily critiqued in a paper publication presenting 13 academic perspectives on the report. This was compiled by Lise Klein and published in October 2014. It was ignored. Instead, Minister Scullion launched the government's response to Forest, the Community Development Program, in December 2014. This response diluted the Forest proposal somewhat. Able-bodied unemployed were not required to work 35 hours a week for the dole, but instead 25 hours, five hours a day, five days a week, year round. This, there was a great deal, this was a great deal more than the 15 hours required under the immediate predecessor program, the Remote Jobs and Communities Program. A punitive disciplinary regime based on penalties was put in place to ensure the unemployed met their mutual obligations. Incomes were quarantined. The only means of escape, panoptic state oversighting, was to get a job, which was deeply problematic in places where there are either none or far too few. Elsewhere, I've referred to this program as the most destructive employment program imposed on remote Indigenous Australia in the modern policy era. When it was first launched, I termed it incoherent and inadequate. It was also riddled with destructive contradictions, uh, some of which I'll outline. First, while it was called the Community Development Program, it mainly targeted individuals. The community development component of its immediate predecessor, the Remote Jobs and Communities Program, was dismantled. Second, like its predecessor, it was unclear if this was a program targeting the unemployed or the Indigenous unemployed? If the former, why was it an Indigenous specific program? Over 80% of the participants were Indigenous. In some of the program 60 regions, nearly 100% were Indigenous. Third, the Community Development Program looked to morally re-engineer the unemployed through harsh workplace discipline and, check and checkbook paternalism but its penalty regime impoverished the very families income management was designed to assist with healthy living. Fourth, the only option the program offered most participants was 25 hours work for the dole at about $10 an hour, half the minimum award wage. Such forced labor was a form of involuntary servitude that was tantamount to modern day slavery that would keep people below the poverty line in perpetuity. Arguably, it reached the Racial Discrimination Act. There is a living case against the Commonwealth being run currently by the Nanyajara. And in my view, it breached Australia's modern slavery act passed in 2018. A paradox, given Forrest, Andrew Forrest's globally renowned anti-slavery Walk Free Foundation. Fifth, while nominally designed to be non-discriminatory, Effectively, the program was regionally racially discriminatory. People in, in remote Australia needed to work twice as much as elsewhere for the dole. And those penalised were disproportionately Indigenous. Sixth, launched in 2015, the Community Development Program did very little in terms of job creation to help close the employment gap of nearly 50% in remote Australia. And finally, the program was costly, requiring between seven and $10,000 per participant per annum to deliver about $15,000 of welfare transfer per participant per annum. Ultimately, the program was much more effective at penalizing the unemployed. There were a total of 715,000 penalties um, that were delivered between 2015 and 2020. I'll just repeat that. 
715,000 penalties. So it's much better at penalising the jobless than moving them into so-called real jobs or 26-week outcomes. There are now more jobless Indigenous people on the program than when it began. When these facts were pointed out using the government's published statistics on numerous occasions in the media, in parliamentary inquiries, in academic research, by, Ab by Aboriginal organisations, the minister just flatly denied this reality. Nevertheless, the program was modified incrementally, notably in 2019, when the work for the dole hours were reduced to 20 hours per week. There was more flexibility and declining penalties. In October 2019, the current Minister White declared in a press release, CDP, CDP reforms delivering for Indigenous Australians. In our discussion paper, and I'll just get uh, Francis to put up our first slide, we produced uh, the following summary figure to document the negative impacts of the program from published research across 12 areas. And if I can summarise those 12 areas very briefly, and you can read them as I go through it. Uh, CD, the, the Community Development Program has pushed people further below the income poverty line. It has destabilised income. It has diluted the final resources, the financial resources of family and kin, reduced housing security, contributed to food insecurity and increased incidence of real hunger undermined people's ability to spend their time in other ways, increased the risk of child safety intervention, contributed to poorer physical health, undermined mental health, and increased episodes of suicidal ideation, increased risk of contact with the criminal justice system, resulted in a one-size-fits-all policy that has disempowered Indigenous people and continued settler colonial patterns of assimilation, causing harm to indigenous livelihoods and futures. And um, as you can see in that diagram, uh, in summary, the community development program has um, impoverished, discriminated against, and disempowered around 30,000 indigenous people in remote Australia, about 30% of the adult population population located there. In March 2020, as an element of the government's COVID response, Minister White suspended job seeker compliance action and work for the dole was made voluntary. The payment of the COVID supplement to those on the program and the liberation from onerous work for the dole seems to have suddenly revealed the program's abject failures. In May 2021, the end of the Community Development Program was announced. The Minister's reasoning on 1st, December, 1st September 2021 was that the Australian jobs landscape has changed significantly with COVID and since the program was last reviewed in 2019. Now, in apparent accord with the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, it is time for new co-design measures to replace CDP with a remote engagement program. The minister's predecessor, Santa Scullion, similarly stated that he had co-designed the community development program with inputs uh, from over 200 indigenous communities that he had visited, something that he articulated on ABC Life Matters in December 2016. So that's the end of my overview. I'd like to now hand over to Francis. Thanks very much, John. And um, before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the country I'm on here this morning, beautiful, sunny uh, Ngunnawal and Nambri land. Um, I'm gonna talk to the outcomes of CDP um, briefly and kind of stylistically, just to provide a bit of a statistical description of what it did and didn't achieve in terms of labour market income and poverty outcomes. Um, I'll do that by narrating a series of five slides. 
Now, um, I think this will this will help to sort of understand the um, the failings of the thinking behind the CDP as much as its implementation. So the first of these slides, which you can see on the screen now, um, goes to the employment question. Now, as John has um, very helpfully described, CDP was really designed to help and hassle Indigenous people in remote Australia out of welfare dependency and into real jobs. And part of the, um, part of the thinking behind that was that um, if people were given training that wasn't training for training's sake, if people were provided with placements, if people were um, most of all uh, incentivized into taking jobs because being on um, part of CDP activities was onerous and difficult in itself, that this would leave people to um, essentially exit the social security system and start taking up um, jobs in the open labor market. Now CDEP, um, really has to be part of the conversation about CDP to some degree because a lot of see how a lot of the thinking behind CDP was in a sense a reaction against CDEP. And for those of you who's um, with a shorter policy memory in this area, CDEP was um, many things, but one of the things that it did was provide. Um, around, at its peak, around 37,000 jobs to Indigenous people across Australia, the bulk of which were in remote, um, remote parts of the country. Um, so this first chart really shows the um, employment to population ratio of remote living, working age Indigenous people. Um, from 1994, when the first National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Survey was fielded by the ABS, to 2018-19, um, the time of the most recent health survey. Um, and so the red line you can see there is what I'm calling open, um, open labour market jobs. So the jobs which weren't provided as part of the CDEP program it, overwhelmingly, these are actually government jobs um, or government funded jobs provided by NGOs. So it's not necessarily the case that these are private sector jobs, but these are jobs that um, weren't part of an explicit employment program. Um, and you can see on this diagram that there's, there was a sort of a long run up in the employment rates from a very, very low base in the open labor market of around 20% in 1994, um, up to the current figure of, I think about 36%. Um, this is pre-COVID-19. Pre um, once CDEP was included, um, there's far more jobs in remote Australia with the um, employment rate well above 50% and higher for men than women, um, although that's not pictured here. But really the story that I'm wanting to tell here today is about what happened between 2008 and 2018. And really three kind of key things happened over that period. The first was the grandfathering of CDEP in 2009 from the 1st of July. The second was its was then the creation of the RJCP, um, which was brought to life on the 1st of July 2013. And finally, the um, creation of CDP, which commenced from the 1st of July 2015. And what we can see is that that transformation of remote employment programs um, really took away all of those CDEP jobs. And so there were around, I think, 15 to 20,000 CDEP jobs in 2008. You can see the difference between the blue line and the red line there. But over the uh, next decade, all of those jobs uh, in the CDEP program were removed 
Now, the thinking was behind the CDP was that this would then lead to a great boost in employment outcomes as people exited welfare dependence and received the um, employment services through their CD provider and find themselves jobs. And clearly that wasn't the case. And so employment um, levels now are little changed from 2008 um, in the open labour market. What's changed is really just been the removal of CDEP jobs. Um, so this, the, this idea that one could incentivise people into jobs has really not eventuated. And primarily, you know, the inference behind this is that because there weren't sufficient suitable jobs for people to enter into. Um, moving on to the second slide, I'm gonna focus a bit in this next set of slides on incomes. What, what has this done for people's incomes? And um, I'm going to demonstrate that the transition from CDEP to CDP has really um, dramatically uh, lowered people's incomes in remote Indigenous Australia um, and talk a little bit about the reasons for that. And one of the primary reasons was this transition from CDEP um, to CDP saw people moving from a program which allowed them top up payments to essentially the standard, um, the standard unemployment benefit, be that new start or job seeker. And so this, this chart again shows median and real weekly gross personal incomes uh, for people in remote Australia in 2008 and 2018. Um, the first, um, the first, uh, data point on that slide shows the median income for employed uh, CDEP workers in 2008 and demonstrates that most CDEP workers received about $330 um, dollars per week. Now that was a combination in most cases of um, uh, top-up payments on top of their standard CDEP wages. Top-up payments were essentially extra hours that CDEP workers could optionally and usually did work from their CDEP provider. And that provided up to around $100 per week more in 2008 when you compared people in remote Australia who were on CDEP to those who were on um, the unemployment benefit. This is a fairly consistent um, finding um, John Altman and um, his collaborators showed a similar effect in 2002 in a paper that they published in 2008. Um, unemployed workers in 2008 received the equivalent of about $250 a week uh, in current money. Um, and what's really happened since then is that with the removal of CDEP, and the introduction of CDP, which only plays um, the rate of new start or job seeker, um, people's incomes haven't really shifted at all. And so um, those who are on CDEP receiving um, close to 350 a week in um, 2008 are now by and large on CDP uh, receiving um, around $250 a week. And that's a huge hit to people's incomes. That's, um, you know, $100 uh, out of $350 a week. The other element that's hits people's incomes with CDP has been the penalty regime. Um, CDP participants are around 55 times more likely to receive a serious penalty for breaching the requirements of the CDPs work for the dole and other mutual obligation requirements than people in the mainstream job active program. Um, most commonly these sort of penalties are no show, no pay, um, which um, unless there's an adequate excuse provided means that people lose about 10% of their fortnightly income. But if participants um, have three of these no show, no pay penalties within six months, 
um, then uh, they might, they're likely to be hit with a suspension or a serious penalty, which um, suspends people's income for eight weeks, which is a huge amount of time to be going without, um, without income support. Um, and so you can see here that when CDP was introduced replacing the RJCP um, from the 1st of July 2015, there was a huge run up in the volume of penalties. And now that's um, been reducing somewhat since the reforms that John alluded to in 2019, but um, penalties are still much higher amongst the CDP uh, recipients than mainstream job active recipients. And because of the financial um, cost of these penalties, this has real implications for people's incomes. Now, why are penalties so high? Um, part of it is to do with the program design. But as you can see from this chart, there's a great deal of variation regionally in terms of the rate of penalties. Now, on this chart, we've got um, all kind of all penalties here, not just serious penalties. And each dot is one of the 60 regions across remote Australia where CDP is active. Um, now, what this chart shows is the mean uh, number of annual penalties per participant in 2017 um, across those 60 regions. That's on the y-axis. Um, you can see that in one region, um, almost 18 penalties per participant per year, whereas in other regions, the penalty rate is very low. Um, and what this chart is showing is that there's a moderate um, correlation between the employment to population ratio of those regions and the um, penalty rate. In areas where there's higher employment, um, generally these are larger regional towns, where there's essentially more jobs going, uh, employment rates are substantially lower, while in areas where employment to population ratios are very low, where there's very few jobs available, um, penalty rates are much higher. And what does this all mean for people's um, livelihoods, for people's ability to earn an income? What we can see using census data is that in remote and especially very remote Australia, Indigenous poverty rates rose substantially between 2011 and 2016. Um, this bar chart um, divides up Australia into remote and very remote and um, shows the progression of poverty rates calculated according to the 50% OECD poverty line. Um, what we can see, especially in remote Australia, is a very big jump um, between 2011. Um, if you cast your mind back to that first slide in 2011, um, uh, CDEP was still yet to be grandfathered. Um, and by 2016, CDP was in place. Um, and so we can see that that introduction of CDP has increased Indigenous poverty rates substantially. Now I'm going to hand over now to Elise Klein and go and fight that baby. Thanks, Francis. Multitasking as usual. Thanks a lot. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm here on the unceded land of the Ngunnawal and pay my respects to elders past and present. I want to talk a bit about some of the logics underpinning CDP um, and in front of you on that screen um, is the theory of change that um, was extracted um, thanks to uh, Lisa Folks who got this under FOI. Um, there's a lot going on uh, in, in that theory of change of CDP, um, but you'll see there that it's talking about a reformed uh, JCP, which then moves into the CDP. Um, and I've, I've circled two sort of main pieces that I want to address. Um, the first is around um, one of the key assumptions around the ways in which uh, individual behaviour uh, is 
uh, a major assumption um, and a major focus area of, of CDP. So, so the assumption is that changing Indigenous behaviours will to get people job ready. Um, and you can see uh, in towards the right hand side of the map the way in which they put to work this assumption, um, the kind of short term outcomes that this behavioural, these behavioural changes will make um, that move towards longer term um, outcomes around sort of bigger developmental uh, uh, outputs of, of the program, uh, including um, various things like children going to school, um, adults in work. Um, and this is important because job readiness has been seen as a plank um, in long term development goals for the settler state um, noted here, uh, but also in uh, our North, our future, the white paper on developing the North Australia, uh, but also state development documents such as the WA's uh, regional reform roadmap following Abbott's declaration of cl closing communities due to what he called lifestyle choices. So this thinking has been informed by various sources, um, the writings of Pearson that, that John spoke to, um, but also intersections with the McClure report uh, and the use of punitive policy tools to create hostile conditions. And it, but it's also important to say that deterrence didn't just start with McClure or even Mead, um, and that iterations of this can be seen throughout um, settler Australia. But before that, um, across the British Empire, uh, and, and all the way back to the poor laws and the application of less eligibility. So the behavioural focus uh, was also accelerated uh, through the Forest Review of Indigenous Employment and Training. Um, and, and Scully and took uh, recommendations in that to uh, launch the CDP. Uh, and Forrest's push was that, that any work was a freedom for Indigenous people um, and that behaviours needed to be set appropriately so that people would take up work. So in the Forest Review, you saw other proposals too, um, such as what he called the Healthy Welfare Card, um, later implemented as the Cashless Debit Card. But as Kiralee Jordan wrote in response to the Forest Review back in 2014, setting up the debate in this way is fundamentally flawed. And I just want to make a couple of points as to, to what, what research has sort of alluded to as, as why. Um, as, as Francis has already outlined, uh, the focus on behaviour um, as a key site of intervention overlooks structural failure in remote and regional labour markets that have const consistently failed to provide enough jobs. It also overlooks that through European invasion, First Nations people have been made dependent on settler modes of economic security and insecurity, including being subjected to racism, dehumanisation, labour market and settler institutions. And just taking one example from the many, early welfare measures such as rations were used by settlers to both dispossess people of their land and control Indigenous labour. Uh, they use ration, The settlers use rations to coerce people onto stations to work for free, the choice being either be hunted by settlers or work for rations under settlers who offered so-called protection. Problematic behaviour as the site of intervention also overlooks that not everyone can be employed, that people may have disability, illness, or be undertaking unpaid care work. And the tightening of DSP eligibility meant, has meant that many people who should be on DSP have actually found themselves on CDP. Problematic behaviour as the site of intervention also overlooks diverse forms of productivity and privileges only certain meanings of work and development while passing off other work and people doing it as unproductive. John Altman and others have long documented that First Nations people uh, engage in productive work on country, undertaking customary work for livelihoods, uh, and that most of this work is, is not valued by the state. But connected to this, unpaid care labour is also not vis visible to the settler state. The caring of people and community as well as caring for country. Uh, unpaid care work can be gendered and hugely important um, is, for, is care for, for community, households, culture and country. Uh, but, in, but, uh, but these types of work are often overlooked and bodies and communities passed off as unproductive, unemployed, 
uh, and not in work, subsequently forced into punitive social security. But it isn't just the overlooking of this important work, but what Fran Na um, Nancy Fraser calls free riding, the expropriation of this work by settler, the settler economy. We know that the capitalist economy free rides on unpaid care labour nationally contributes to about the equivalent of 50% of GDP, depending on how you measure it. But there's also important questions about how much does the Australian economy free ride on First Nations social reproduction, which includes not just the effective and material care of people, which is huge, but also the caring of country and culture. So it's not just about how these logics, we can see these logics over time, but also how behavioural logics are also reproduced across other social security policies, which often target the same communities, households, and even individuals as CDP. For example, the compulsory income management, so basics card and now the, and the cashless debit card. So money being quarantined on debit like card um, assumes problematic behaviours and, um, and addressing these as a way to turn the tide for Indigenous development outcomes introduced through the Northern Territory intervention and relaunched uh, through forests creating parity as a key plank for his vision of Indigenous development. But also other work programs such as Parents Next, which uses sanctions for single parent households to change behaviours to be work ready, even though by definition these parents are working a bit unpaid, which was and has been trialled at what government calls at risk areas, which includes high Indigenous populations now rolled out nationally. And we see this kind of thinking also through some uh, transitional housing programs, which tries to change behaviours um, in various ways, such as one person with a house, um, uh, sorry, um, to, to be able to be eligible for the program, somebody must have a job. These programs are all ongoing and carry forward the logic of using punitive approaches to change assumed deficit behaviour. And the thinking is somehow through doing this, we'll get people into employment and also reach broader development outcomes. So to summarise, can I just say this, the minister announced the end to CDP, and this of course has been largely welcome, but I think it's important that we think about what is actually being discontinued and what is not. Any policy is made up of various components, including legislative frameworks, various policy actors, institutions, technologies, administrative processes, and logics, and logics are one component. So we must ask what has actually ceased with C or will cease with CDP. Have these logics of individual behaviour as a key focus been ceased? Uh, or will it will con continue in future programs, perhaps with a few changes? Does this thinking live on decision makers and bureaucrats, uh, Forrest and Minderu's vision for development in programs that continue through Parents Next and the CDC? Uh, the minister has announced that co-design to the new program has acknowledged that there aren't enough jobs, but does this mean the end of using punitive approaches and does it mean delinking development outcomes with individual behaviour? Thanks, I'll hand over to Zoe. Thanks, Elise. Um, so Francis, if we could just flick on, excellent. Uh, so first, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the beautiful unceded lands on which I'm currently sitting here in central Brisbane in Queensland, the Yagara and Turrbal peoples who have thrived on, nurtured and uh, being nurtured by these lands for millennia. So I wanna take these last sort of 10 to 15 minutes um, in our presentation today to sort of extend on the points that John, Francis and Elise have really already made, but by focusing particularly or, or um, focusing in particularly on the contracting and administrative arrangements that have been part of CDP. And to consider how these have also been, um, I'll argue, quite problematic, a quite problematic aspect of the program and something that we should also really reflect on in this sort of post-mortem phase as Francis um, has pre previously referred to it, which I quite liked. Um, as Elise also pointed to, looking at this broader context emphasizes really how CDP is also deeply embedded in arrangements and, and in logics that extend far beyond the program itself and which will perhaps 
uh, unless perhaps we give them some greater attention and, uh, you know, collectivization <laughs> around changing these sorts of logics, um, potentially outlive the program itself. So, as many of you will be aware, CDP is delivered within broader uh, new public management or NPM contracting arrangements, which pursue neoliberal objectives, uh, including the marketization of employment services through outsourcing to third sector providers. CDP also operates within a longer standing neoliberal context of an increasingly strong focus on activation of individual uh, unemployed persons, as uh, Elise has so eloquently just outlined. Um, so this has seen Australian policies since uh, the mid to late 1980s, in particular, sort of target unemployed peoples themselves for behaviour and training interventions, while ignoring the broader structural factors that, that are direct uh, causes of high unemployment in remote Australia. And this has been increasingly intensified, particularly over the last 20 years, as, uh, as Elise just pointed to, under various sort of welfare reform uh, strategies that place increasingly strict conditions and overlapping conditions with multiple policies on welfare receipt. So really, in many ways, CDP is um, sort of a very logical extension of the kind of path dependency that we've seen in policy making around unemployed populations, not only in Australia, but also in other liberal uh, uh, welfare states as well across the world. Under this broader context, we've also seen a great deal of political rhetoric uh, that suggests that marketization of services um, is a way of giving control back to the community sector. Under CDP, for example, the word community has been repeatedly used, um, most obviously in the, in the renaming of the program, um, repeatedly used as a rhetorical device to insinuate community design and control, where the reality is, I'll argue, much different uh, to that. So this has occurred, for instance, in claims like this one by former minister Nigel Scullion, that having Indigenous organisations deliver CDP would be sort of a sure way of increasing local community control over the program. Um, but this is, yeah, as I'll now turn to, quite problematic in several different ways. Francis, can I ask you to flick on? Excellent, thank you. So I just want to say, uh, first up, you know, contracting, contracting Indigenous organisations to deliver services can, of course, be incredibly beneficial in, in many different ways. Um, you know, there's very good evidence that Indigenous organisations are generally more effective at delivering services to Indigenous peoples. They deliver more culturally appropriate services and, and when they're local and community controlled in particular, uh, they often have the kind of deep knowledge of networks and relationships that is necessary for navigating service delivery, uh, particularly in small remote communities. Funding Indigenous organisations to deliver services in remote communities also obviously creates opportunities for paid employment, uh, despite doing so through the kind of um, poverty industry model that Daniel Hatcher talks about in his book, and which can capture organisational objectives within a sort of profit-seeking framework that can skew those objectives away from community needs. While, however, political rhetoric focuses on outsourcing as an avenue for empowerment, the reality is that it is often experienced as the opposite by Indigenous peoples, communities and organisations. So we've seen this, for instance, under the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, uh, which I won't get into uh, today, but many of you will be very familiar with. And this has also uh, certainly been the case under CDP. So firstly, the Indigenous community controlled sector had little to no input into the design of CDP. Uh, the community was essentially excluded from the community development program. In essence, the program is delivered in a top-down way to suit the state's framing of the unemployment problem in remote Australia, problem in inverted commas. Um, that is as being a problem of poor individual behaviour, which, which um, my colleagues have touched on. But it's the, it's, you know, the absence of jobs which Indigenous communities and peoples have been pointing out for decades is a more significant problem in remote Australia. Second, program providers who competitively tender for and win CDP contracts through decisions made by government, not by community, um, must abide by strict program rules. And this leaves very little room for movement. Indigenous organisations can only make limited 
autonomous decisions within the bounds of these strict rules, strict rules. And if they step outside of these lines, they are either performance managed and or have their contracts simply discontinued. Um, and this is something that is talked about quite a bit in the CDP research. And we've seen uh, this talked about quite a bit as a, a significant problem by CDP providers um, and in the research by, including by Inga Kral, who I think is joining us today or was earlier. As Scullion is reported to have said, providers are simply treated as a delivery arm of government. And if they don't do the job well, then the government will simply get someone else to do it. So this is an approach that is obviously far from being empowering. Program participants also operate within a similar logic, where if they step outside the strict program rules, they have their social security incomes first suspended for up to eight weeks, uh, but sometimes also removed for longer than this for those who for those participants who simply choose to disengage with the program or from the program and from the social security system more broadly um, because it is simply too uh, difficult too complex and too punitive to navigate and we've seen increases in the number of people who have disengaged from cdp overall um, particularly up until and this is quite telling until mutual obligations under the program were suspended um, at the start of 2020 in response to COVID 19 and when we saw um, uh, program numbers or participant numbers increase again so this essentially means that indigenous peoples organizations and communities are disempowered at all levels of the program Organisations in particular are hamstrung by the program's strict contracting and administration arrangements. And while they may have incredible knowledge and value to bring to the table as Indigenous organisations, they often can't act on it. So overall, this creates, I argue, a context where CDP providers, service providers, um, including Indigenous service providers and program participants alike are coerced into a system that sort of drip feeds income from the state in the form of service delivery contracts and also social security payments, but only on the strict basis of compliance with the settler state's centrally determined rules and regulations. Thanks, Francis. So I've argued elsewhere that this is less about the kind of traditional oversimplified and now largely um, debunked kind of view of neoliberalism as concerning primarily a sort of roll back of the state. Um, and instead, this is really more akin to what SOS and Sanford Tram and, and their colleagues refer to as a kind of neoliberal paternalism, which involves the defence of a free market economy via the extension of state power through the mechanisms of neoliberalism. Um, and that includes through contractual relationships with third party providers. So in this way, under CDP, the governance and disciplinary practices of the state work through community organisations to enforce market principles and sort of train unemployed peoples into pursuing uh, freedom, freedom within the bounds of market rationality, as Nicholas uh, Rose might refer to it. So that is Indigenous peoples must choose life as it is presented to them by the neoliberal settler state, or else be cut off from accessing state support and thrust even to, into even deeper poverty, as Francis showed us earlier, which obviously has its catalyst in settler colonialism in the first place. So through these modes of governing, Indigenous peoples are strategically disempowered. Indeed, the pathway to empowerment is so tightly prescribed that it is simply not empowerment at all. This is, of course, as I mentioned before, a long standing issue that has been recognised as a, a key problem with NPM uh, new public management contracting approaches more generally. Um, you know, this, this Bryson and Mowbray quote that I've got on the slide here from their 1981 paper draws attention to this and is reflective of the kinds of practices that we still see under CDP um, outsourcing that since only types of services are funded and only in accordance with decisions made centrally, and since matters ranging, ranging from operating guidelines to numbers and qualifications of staff and height of toilet bowls are covered by centrally determined regulations, the community management label may actually misrepresent the real situation of tokenism. 
Bryson and Mowbray also draw on an earlier 1977 paper by Jones to quite nicely, I think, describe the term uh, community as a kind of aerosol word because of the way, the hopeful way that it is sprayed over deteriorating institutions to give the impression of community ownership when the reality can be far different. So as I said earlier, CDP is simply a more punitive, but nevertheless logical extension to the kind of path dependency that we've seen in policy making around unemployment over the past couple of decades. The inclination for government to sort of spray the word community around and see what sticks as a disguise for these kinds of disempowering arrangements uh, has also been a part of a longer standing trend as Bryson and Mowbray, Mowbray referred to in their 1981 paper. And then again in their 2005 revision of their earlier argument, and as others like Philip Mendes uh, down at Monash have also argued in relation to other aspects of Australian social policy as well, including income management policies. So this really draws attention though to the need for us not to, to not only focus on the details of CDP and its programmatic failings, but also on this broader context, which is overwhelmingly experienced as being disempowering and very, very harmful. We need to keep asking what this means for life after CDP, how a future policy might avoid being trapped within this broader logic, and how those who are invited to participate in the ongo ongoing so-called co-design of a new program can push up against this incredible path dependency that's been seen over recent decades to instead create a context that is more empowering of Indigenous peoples, communities and organisations rather than being the opposite, the exact opposite. Thank you very much. I'll throw it back to you, Anique. Sorry, for some reason my mouse didn't want to work. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Zoe, Elise, Francis, and um, John. It was a very detailed and interesting presentation. I didn't read quite everything that was on the slides, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there's a lot of food for thoughts here.